I want to thank everybody for hopping on today. Uh, today we're actually going to be going over the QSC Premium Business Music Solutions. And today we're actually joined by Dale Sandberg from QSC. Dale, are you there? I am here. Yes, thank you. And thank I guess with Dale. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm excited to be here. And uh, I guess without any further ado, I'll uh, I'll just get get rolling. Um, I think if there are if questions pop up, if you just want to put them in the was it the Q and A? Is that what it was? Yeah, that would be best. Uh, oh. If we, if everybody could instead of doing it in chat, just do it straight into the Q and A. That way, we've got one place to look. That would be the the best way to do it. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and and get rolling here. Um, about uh, uh, oh, a little over a year ago, we developed some new products. Uh, QSC, if, if you're not familiar or that familiar with the brand, um, one of the things that we um, try to do is we try to create complete solutions. So um, a few years ago, we d developed uh, or we started working on some products to create a complete uh, um, solution for what we call business music. And, and even that business music isn't a great title because they are very, very broadly applicable. It's basically any application where audio is in the system but it may not be the primary focus of the system. And so, I mean, this could be school gymnasiums. It could be, um, we've seen people use these products in, in uh, um, uh, churches. We've seen a lot of people use them for restaurant, retail, fitness uh, um, applications. So a lot of different uh, um, systems uh, like that. Um, and oh, let me just go click here and there we go. The products that we um, came out with at that time was uh, um, a, a new processor, a zone mixer, um, some new amplifiers, and some new loudspeakers. Now, um, we don't really have time to, and, and it's really hard to, uh, to do a webinar on loudspeakers. You really want to hear those. Um, the, the new amplifiers are, are very intriguing. Um, some, you know, they have a, a technology in them called FlexAmp that makes them extremely capable and, and basically you can share power across channels. But I'm gonna spend the majority of the time today talking about the new zone mixers or processors. Um, at that time, we, we basically created a couple of different uh, uh, products here. They're called the MPM series. Um, MP stands for music and paging, M for mixer, so music and paging mixer. Um, but basically, this is a, a DSP processor designed to provide um, all kinds of capabilities for these, uh, uh, these types of um, applications. Both of the uh, MPM mixers are uh, pretty much identical with the exception of the number of inputs and outputs. The MPM 40 offers eight, uh, input, eight total inputs. Uh, half of those are mic line inputs with fan and power. The other half are mono summing RCAs, uh, line level inputs uh, designed to interface with uh, you know, dish receivers, uh, CD players, those kinds of um, consumer type devices. And then we've got four outputs for zoning. The MPM80, um, same sort of architecture. We've got a total of 16 inputs. Half of those are mic line inputs. Uh, the other eight are uh, line level inputs. And then uh, eight outputs for zoning. Everything else is identical in the, um, within these devices. Um, you've got also, in addition to the, the standard outputs designed for zoning, there is a dedicated output for music on hold. And so it, many times in these applications, uh, you know, people wanna be able to, uh, can I send music to my um, phone system? And yes, in this case you can, this output is dedicated for uh, connecting to a phone system, to a PBX. In fact, it's transformer balanced and designed to uh, function. Uh, in that uh, in that way, there's also two dedicated uh, general purpose inputs, and these are these are basically logic inputs that allow you to um, you know recall scenes and uh, um, uh, connect to a fire alarm uh, to mute the system that that kind of a thing. For general control, of course, we've got Ethernet, and that's how I'm going to be controlling the system that I have here. Um, uh, we also do have um, these ports that are set aside for our wall controllers that we call MFCs, uh, multifunction controllers. Um, and so each port will drive up to four wall controllers. So you've got a total of eight wall controllers that can be used. And this uses RS-485 so they can, 
so they can run really long distances. And I'll talk more about those in, in just a moment. On the front panel of the device, you've got a couple of other things. You've got a headphone jack so that you can actually do signal verification. Uh, they're really handy when setting a system up. So, you know, I can, I can actually plug in a set of headphones and now verify I've got input coming in or even I can uh, um, connect to my outputs uh, uh, using the software and verify that the signal's going to the right places. Um, I've also got a USB port so I can walk up to the unit. I have my uh, program file on a USB stick plug it in the front and uh, um, you know, select the right program and away we go. Now the architecture of the uh, MPM devices is uh, um, pretty straightforward. Your, you have your inputs uh, obviously and uh, all your inputs are available um, and any input can be selected as a source for an output. The way this functions is I, I I actually think of it backwards. I start from my output side and I go to zone one and I select, oh, I'm gonna select uh, um, input source number three or four, whatever that is. And, uh, and so I can choose each of my input sources. Now, in addition to the, um, the source selection capability, there is actually a mixer um, available. So that mixer can be selected as a source. That mixer can mix any number of these inputs. Um, and then of course there's input and output processing. Input processing to condition the signal, um, output processing to, uh, to do any loudspeaker processing that you might need to or, or things that necessary for the zones. So that's kind of the basic architecture of the, of the MPM units. Now I spoke earlier about uh, the wall controllers when you're talking with customers, control is the system. And so we spent a lot of time developing our control interfaces. Now this black square one, that's just the European style. They, they have square boxes in Europe. Um, and actually they've got round wall boxes in some parts of Europe. Um, but uh, obviously in the US, uh, most of us would be using the, the Decora style. And so this is what our MFC looks like. Um, and you can get those in black and white. Um, so we've got our MSCs, you can have up to eight of those. And uh, um, you know, they can be as far as 250 um, meters away. That's almost 850 feet. Um, there's also a dedicated application for smartphone control. And you can also run this on a tablet. This uh, application is designed for the end user. We call it MP Manage. And so you can give them things like zone control, so volume and source select. You can recall scenes. Um, you can even schedule scenes from the, uh, from the application. Um, of course, if you've got multiple users, you've got to be able to manage security and who has what levels of access control. Um, I can control my mixer from my uh, smartphone. And I can also do, a, it's a pretty cool function called uh, um, wireless store and forward paging. So from my phone, I can use the microphone on my phone to make a page into the system. And as long as I'm connected via Wi-Fi to that system, I can uh, control and, and you know, that, that page, everything goes through the system. So pretty, um, pretty slick interface. Um, now that is for the end user. Again, that's called MP Manage. To set the system up, we've got another application called MP Install. Now this is what we'll be spending the majority of our time uh, in today but this is how we would uh, configure this. Um, actually, I should go back to MP Manage real quick. So this is available for iOS and Android, um, any sort of smartphone or tablet. The MP install application is available on tablets, iOS and Android. You can also um, control it using a Windows PC, which is how I'm gonna control my system today. So I am now going to, um, let's see, I need to share a different screen and this is MP install. So here I have my basic uh, uh, interface for MP install and I'm using an MPM 40. So I've got a total of eight inputs. Here's my four mic line inputs. Here's my four sets of RCAs, and I've already set this up in, if, in my home office, and, and uh, so I've got a CD player that I'm getting audio from. Under more, so here's my mic line, here's my RCAs. Under more, I've got two digital inputs. I've actually got a USB player 
um, and I'm playing um, MP3 files from a USB stick. And if I was to use this with my uh, Wi-Fi paging, this is where that Wi-Fi page would come in, so from the network. And so these are, these are all my inputs. The other thing I want to point out is all my navigation is down the right hand side. So he, these are my inputs. These are my, in this case, four outputs. The MPM80 would have eight outputs. And uh, um, here's my mixer. So all of these things are readily available. Really, really simple and straightforward to access. Now we created a, um, a setup function. And one of the things as we were developing this product, uh, um, one of the things that we found is many integrators said a, a very similar thing. I can find my way around the DSP. My biggest problem is I'm not sure when I'm done programming. What this told us is that the, you know, the, the, Integrators understand they need to be able to set up the gain structure. They need, need to be able to have the signal path set so they can do some EQ and, and provide the various control elements that they need to. But they didn't necessarily have the confidence that they had done every step correctly and, uh, or, or done every single step. And so what we did is we just gave them a checklist. And so if you go through this checklist, and this is just a, a list of links, if you go through this checklist and check them off, you can have you can feel confident that you've done everything that you need to do. As an example, load the configuration. So in this case, uh, you know there's a couple of different configurations that I've got here in my uh, um, storage, my application storage, and so maybe I want to load this o Orange Theory Fitness um, application, uh, um, you know that I had uh, done previously. So here's Orange Theory Fitness, and it should uh, it does take a second to to transfer sometimes. Um, so that'll that'll be coming across here into my internal memory for this uh, for this device. Um, I've also got uh, some uh, some configuration files here on on a USB stick, and so there it is. There's the Orange Theory Fitness, um, and so there's uh, um, these are just on my uh, um, USB stick, and so I could select one of those, go back to my setup wizard, and check this box off. Now, <laughs> I'm I'm a little bit embarrassed because I've noticed a software bug. I checked this box off. It should have actually shown in the progress bar, and there is a bug here. Um, it's just cosmetic. It doesn't show that uh, box is checked. And in fact, when I go to the next thing, my input configuration and come back to the setup wizard, it goes away. So I need to, I need to hit the software engineers and tell them they, they need to fix that bug, but it's pretty minor. The next step would be going to my input configuration. So let's say I want to set up one of my inputs as a paging microphone. And so here's uh, input one. I just set this up and this is a paging mic. And uh, um, you can see the name transferred here. I've got polarity invert. Um, if this is a stereo source, I can link those. Um, here's my input trim, phantom power for the microphones. I do have an input delay. And so if I'm uh, receiving audio from a video matrix, as an example, sometimes your video signal is delayed uh, uh, going through that, uh, that video matrix. And so I can delay the audio to match the video. Just a useful feature that's available on all the inputs. So I'm setting up input one. Great, I've got this set up. I'll go to the next input, input two. You can see that's input two, and I could set that up. Input three, input four, et cetera. Great, I've set up, I've set up all my inputs. I checked that box off. And that's what you should have seen with the load configuration. Anyway, like I've done on the input side, I would want to go and set up my output side. And so I would go to output configuration. And in this case, I've already set it up uh, for, the, for the home office, but I can do a similar thing. I can name this output and, and you know, go ahead and type in a name, stereo linked, polarity invert. Um, one thing to note here is I do have a minimum and a maximum level. Now, the, the zone level is controlled by this fader right here. And you can actually hear as I'm adjusting this, there's music in the background because I've got a source selected there. And, uh, and so, and, and you can see the numbers, they, they go from zero to 100%. And I'm not gonna turn it all the way up because it'll get loud, but zero to 100%. But that zero to 100% are governed by, governed by my minimum and my maximum. And so I can set a min and a max for this particular zone. There, now that's as loud as that's gonna get. 
or maybe just a little bit louder, whatever I want to set that at. And this is as soft as that's going to get. So it's a really easy way to set up my minimum and maximum for that particular zone so that the employees or, or whoever is adjusting the control, whether it's the wall control or the smartphone control, they can't, they can't take it beyond the boundaries of, the, of uh, where that system really should be. So um, the minimum and maximum is very handy. And again, output delay, you know, if, if needed. So just, uh, just some tools there for my output configuration. I can go to the next output. Now these are stereo links, so they're the same, but here's a, here's a different output, that's, that's patio, right? Um, and, and again, I can, I can set each one of those up. Great, I'm happy with my outputs. Now, the next thing I would wanna do is set up my output sources, the sources that are available for each of these outputs. So here I'm going to go and I'm on patio. I'm going to go back to my, um, my main office and I can select the list of sources. Now in this case, I've got the USB player and that's what I'm listening to right now. I've got a Bluetooth input. I've got uh, uh, audio from my PC and I've got a CD player. And if I select that CD player, uh, should be Michael Jackson CD. There we go. So I can, I can select from those different sources. If I go and select one of these down here, no audio is gonna play because there is no audio source selected. And so if I wanna change this or I, won't, I only want three sources available, in fact, I'm, what I'll do is I'll make three sources available and I'm gonna get rid of this. So I'm gonna turn this to the CD player and I'm gonna turn this and I just scroll down and select none and now there's my CD player, here's my USB audio player, and now I've only got three sources that will show up on my wall controllers and my smartphone. So these are my selectable sources that are available, and I can adjust the, their independent levels uh, right here for each, for this particular zone, um, the office zone. And again, uh, outputs one and two are stereo linked, so they're, they're identical. Now, before I move on, I, I also should show you the priority override. So these are your sources that are selectable by the end user, but you may want to have an override. Um, one example could be an emergency page. The other example could be a, um, or, or, you know, Wi-Fi paging, or maybe you've got a jukebox, right? You're set, setting this up. It's a, it's a 50s diner. They've got a jukebox in the corner. Um, and so what I could do is I could maybe go to my secondary input or secondary priority override and choose my jukebox. Now I don't have a jukebox, but let's pretend I've got a jukebox coming in on input three. And in fact, if I went to input three, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna do that for fun. If I go to input three, I'm gonna call this a jukebox. So jukebox. So now when I go back to my output sources, you can see that I've selected input three and it is my indeed my jukebox, so great. And now I can select the, set the source level. So how loud that jukebox is going to be in the zone. And then here's my ducker controls. So this is the threshold. At what point when the jukebox plays, so once it gets, a, once it has a signal beyond, let's say 40 D minus 40 dB, then it will allow that jukebox to play and it will duck the whatever's selected here. Um, how far will it duck it? Well, here's, you know, I can, I can set this anywhere from, from essentially zero all the way up to, you know, 60 dB. Um, and so, you know, mostly if I'm going to duck a music source, I'm, I'm probably just going to duck at 30, 40 dB. However, I have had people use this for fitness instructors. So the fitness instructor, when they, you know, let's say you've got a spin class and you want the spin instructor's microphone to duck the music, but only by three or six dB, you can set this up. And now when that spin instructor well, let's be honest, the spin instructor is yelling at the class. So when the spin instructor yells at the class, it's gonna duck the music, but only by, you know, whatever I set this at, 6 dB or something like that. And then the hold control is how long that will duck the music after the, the jukebox, the spin instructor, whatever, stops talking or stops playing, how long until this music source ramps back up to its full level. So, 
um, this, uh, um, this priority override is, is a, a pretty useful feature. And again, it could be used for an emergency page. And I would set that up as my, as my primary source in that case. Um, if it truly is an emergency page, then, you know, then it's something that I want to be able to even override the zone level. So no matter what my level is here, it will play. So I hit override zone level. So now it doesn't matter if this is pulled all the way down, it will play at whatever level it's assigned to play at. So just some, just some uh, different uh, um, uh, tools that are available there for my, for my sources and then the priority override sources. And again, I'm just working through my, my various zones. So this is zone one, which happens to be a stereo zone. Zone two would be set up differently. So I would, you know, maybe have some other source coming in here and uh, um, uh, yeah, that jukebox maybe or, or whatever and, and set up different sources here for that particular zone. Great, I've set, up, I've set up all my zones for the sources. Super, now I'm gonna move on. Now, the, probably the, the most important architectural feature is the loudspeakers. And so that will be the next thing on the setup menu. Uh, here I'm in my patio, and, uh, but maybe I'll go back to my you know, zone one. And uh, um, in this particular case, I'm using a pair of QSC ADS-6 uh, um, uh, loudspeakers. We've got a complete list of, of all the QSC um, loudspeakers here. And, uh, um, you know, the nice thing about this is the fact that it has the full speaker tuning available. So I could choose the, those, uh, you know, K.2 series or some E series loudspeakers, some e, um, E10s or E12s, and then load that, uh, that tuning into that, into that output. Now, obviously, this is just the QSC loudspeakers. However, if you do have other loudspeakers that you regularly use, you could go into the filter set and you could create your own speaker tuning. And so maybe you need to high pass these and, and you want to make an adjustment here. And you've got all the parameters. This is, it's a six band fully parametric um, uh, EQ with high and low pass filtering so that you could, uh, um, you know, you could band pass, you could do all the things you would need to do it with, for a normal speaker tuning. Um, and uh, uh, turn this into a shelf and I'm gonna boop, bump that up and you know, whatever. So once I've got this spe you know, speaker tuning for this, maybe it's a JBL control, maybe it's a Tannoy, whatever it is, great. I can go back to presets and I can actually save that as a user preset. And so I can, you know, sure, I'm going to save this as, uh, um, you know, these are Bob's speakers, whatever. Um, and, you know, hit save. Great. So now Bob's speakers, and every time I use Bob's speakers, it, you know, I can just pull them from my list right here. Again, go to the next output and, and adjust, you know, adjust each one independently. So I've set up my loudspeakers and uh, I'm working my way through the setup process. Now, um, at this point, I'm probably done with the majority of my architectural settings, but maybe I want to adjust some input DSP. So here I can go and, and uh, you know, maybe I want to adjust that paging mic EQ. I'm gonna turn that EQ on. I definitely want to high pass so you don't get the plosives. Um, but I want to make that maybe a little bit more intelligible. So a little bit of a bump here in the, uh, you know, two to two to five K range. And, um, and, you know, I can, and I can just uh, adjust that this is a four band parametric uh, uh, available for this with high and low pass filtering. So um, some tools here. I've also got a dynamics function. If it's a microphone, I might want to use the compressor. And so I could adjust my threshold, my attack uh, release settings. I do have a simple mode. If you're not familiar with the compressor settings, the simple mode really makes it kind of a one knob squeezer or one fader um, uh, compressor that uh, adjusts several parameters simultaneously. Um, uh, so again, just a, just a tool there. I'm gonna hit reset on that. Um, the other thing, and take it out of simple mode. The other thing I do have is um, if I, uh, so compressors are great for um, microphones. However, if I've got a content source, I would probably want to use the automatic gain control. And in this case, what I can do is I can set a gain range here in my target. And now 
what the algorithm is going to do is it's going to try to keep the music content within that target range. Um, it, really, really useful. Obviously, as you know, if I'm, you know, if I'm playing a CD uh, or, or um, a streaming source that, you know, was uh, um, uh, for, for a song that came out, you know, a month ago, it's going to be much higher in gain than, than a track produced in the 70s or 80s. Uh, maybe not so much the 80s, but certainly in the 70s. Um, and, uh, and so that automatic gain control is really, really helpful for leveling the different uh, um, audio sources or the different music content. A noise gate is available. Again, this could be for noisy sources, probably most useful for microphones. And you can set your threshold and you know attack release and the, and the various settings for the, for the noise gate here. I go back to my inputs and I can see I've turned those elements on. Now, because one thing I didn't tell you is the MPM processors were developed utilizing the engine from our touch mix mixers, which means I've got the full set of presets. Now, uh, maybe a bass or drum presets or guitars won't necessarily be that helpful, but there are some, some uh, vocals and speech settings. So, uh, you know, a podium microphone, and if, if I hit recall on that, yes, go ahead and recall that. Now I've got a parametric EQ that was set utilizing real podium microphones. A compressor that was set utilizing that that uh, um, again that microphone and uh, the gate in this case is still turned off and so I've got presets available and these are real world presets that do work well. So anyway, just uh, just uh, some tools there on my inputs and again I can go to the different inputs and and you know adjust them as needed. Great, I've set up my inputs. I can do the same thing on the output side. So here it takes me to my output DSP. Now the things that we've already covered is we've gone into our setup, which is uh, what we see what we see there. We've also gone into sources. These are our, uh, various sources that are available for each output zone, and these are our speaker presets. Other tools that I have, I've got a graphic EQ that's available on each output. And so uh, um, uh, again, you know, I think everybody knows how to use a graphic EQ. Uh, you know, what you what you see is what you get. There is a real-time analyzer that's part of that uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, or is available per per output, and so I can I can see the signal that is actually being uh, routed through that. And if I make adjustments, I will see those uh, those changes. There is also a feedback suppression algorithm. Now, this in general is useful primarily for live sources. Um, you know, if I'm doing if I'm doing a system for the the restaurant and they've got a little stage in the corner and the acoustic trio comes in, now now that's something that I probably would use for that acoustic trio and and uh, you know especially if they've got problems with feedback and I've got up to twelve filters available that I can that I can adjust uh, um, with that feedback suppression algorithm. A tool that I really would use all the time actually is this loudness control. Now I, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take a minute to explain that. Um, let me turn. There, I'm gonna select a different. Go to my silence. Okay. Um, let me explain this. The uh, some of you may uh, may be familiar with these uh, EQ curves in in the background here. Those are called the equal loudness contours. Some people call them the Fletcher Munson curves. Um, basically, uh, in the 30s, doctors Fletcher's and Munson. Um, discovered that our ears are not flat. Um, and basically at different volumes, our ears respond differently. And they found that at soft volumes, we need to hear more low frequency for it to sound equal loudness. In other words, um, well, if, in order for it to sound flat, basically. At higher volumes, we actually need less low frequency. And so they came up with these curves. And so what we've done is we've created a loudness function that models those curves. And the way that I would use this is I would set my fader in the middle of the zone, um, in the middle of its range, somewhere in the mid 50s, something like that. 50 is great, 50%. I would then set the threshold just underneath that. The way our ears respond is when we turn the volume up, we hear more low frequency. This is why. This is why every time you hear a loudspeaker demo, people always turn it up. 
because then you get more low frequency response. Everything sounds great when it's turned up. The problem is when we turn the system down, our ears start to lose that low frequency response, which is why when the volume gets turned down, things often sound thin or tinny. Well, what we're doing is we're compensating for that. So once I cross this threshold, I begin boosting the bass and actually a little bit of the high frequency following these, these equal loudness contours. The more I pull the volume down, the more I'm boosting the bass and the high frequency. The more I push it up, the less I boost. Once I cross the threshold, I'm no longer boosting. So it's just a way to maximize the musicality of the system to make it perform as good as it can while still um, you know, keeping the system within, within its, its uh, range. And so it's a, 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 this is actually a very useful tool, especially for background music systems, where part of the time they are gonna be turned down and, and they're soft. When it's soft, you still wanna have the full music extension into the low frequency in particular. So this loudness tool is, is, is uh, really, really useful. And then finally, there's a limiter on the output that I can use to limit the output to protect my loudspeakers, basically, and the rest of the system. So those are the tools that I have uh, on, the, uh, on the output to, uh, DSP. Those are the output DSP elements. I can go into my setup wizard, check that box off. Now I'm pretty much done with this system setup, but I do still need to set up wall controllers. In this case, I would I can name each controller. So um, you know maybe this is uh, um, uh, you know the um, I don't know restaurant. Well, I've actually got a patio zone, so why don't I call it patio? So patio, great. And I can choose whether to set this up as a single zone, multi zone. If I want to if I want to have multiple oh single zone, I should just select patio. Um, Multi-zone, if I want to actually control multiple zones, and if I put it in multi-zone, it just gives me an additional menu. I have to first choose the zone I want to control, and then I can choose volume and source select. There's also a scenes only mode. So in scenes only, then you can only recall the scenes. We've had customers ask for that, so that's something we, we provided. Um, and I've got, like I said before, up to eight different wall controllers. So, you know, if I've got another, uh, uh, controller in the system. This could be from my bar. And, uh, and then let's pretend the office is, is my bar and I'm going to there. So there's my bar and my office is it's not going to be very productive, but uh, could be fun. And then I've got a different, uh, you know, set up for the patio. When I'm, when I'm happy with what I've done here, setting up my wall controllers, all I need to do is select the wall controller, hit the pair button, and now it's telling me to press any button on the wall controller. What you don't see, unfortunately, is, is the wall controllers that I've got connected to this system just lit up and said, press a button to pair this device. And it gives me a little ASCII um, uh, address. So if I push this button, it says, yes, it's unpaired from that one. And now it's paired with this one. So now, now my wall controller is set up. And if I go to my bar, which is controlling my office, and I'm just going to go into my sources here, I can now select my USB player, and I can adjust my volume, and you hear a little U2 in the background, still haven't found what I'm looking for, and I'm adjusting that from my wall controller. I can select a different source, now my CD player, and a little bit of a thriller going on in the background. So that is use, utilizing the wall controller. And now I'm gonna select silence. Okay, so that's wall controllers. Go back to my setup wizard. Great, I've set up all my wall controllers. Now the last step would be setting up smartphones. Smartphones are similar to wall controllers. I just got more stuff I can set up. And so in this case, um, I've got these different users that, that I can, uh, uh, you know, set up for. And so I've got the manager and maybe the manager will only have control of a couple of zones, but maybe I do need to give the manager access to paging and he needs to be able to recall scenes. Um, and certainly security. That's the one thing that the manager always has access to. 
Um, and maybe that's it. Or maybe I can give him access to the, uh, to the audio mixer, right? He can get in and mix, you know, the, the trio, whatever. Great. I hit save. Yes, that saves that profile. And now I can go and set up a, so maybe I'm going to set up a spin instructor, right? Uh, um, so spin instructor. Boom. Okay. And now let's pretend that the uh, patio is my spin studio. I just want her, her, that's horribly sexist. I just want the spin instructor, him, um, to be able to control that one zone and uh, not do any paging. Um, but maybe recall scenes. Maybe I've got a few different scenes for some different uh, spin classes. And oh, but maybe he can bring in his music on a USB stick, that kind of a thing. Great. And I hit save. So now I have the ability to assign. Um, so the manager can then assign uh, uh, people uh, within the organization that spin instructor level. So Tom, my new spin instructor, he comes in, he connects his phone to the system via Wi Fi it shows up on my phone saying, there's a new user called Tom, Tom's phone. And so now I select Tom's phone. I say, you're a spin instructor. And it gives him control over the patio level and over these functions. He doesn't get any other control. He can't control any other zones. He can't control any other pieces of the system. Um, and so I can go and, and set up each of these different levels with different user control. I would go back to my setup wizard. Great, I've set up all my smartphones. Um, at this point, I've pretty much done everything that I would need to do. There is one last step um, that I can do. Again, these I don't have to go through these steps, but these are just useful, um, uh, you know, tools that that kind of guide me through the setup. There is a report function, and this allows me to, you know, type in. Great, this is. Uh, um, um, uh, cycle spin studio whatever right um and uh, work order number um, one two three four five six seven great and uh you know this is uh, um uh, 37 peach tree street must be in georgia um and who's the electrical contractor and type in his information who's the project manager whatever you know, who am I? And I can type in my information. When I'm all done, I hit generate report. This creates a text file. That text file can then be saved. Um, in this case, it's saved to my, uh, just a standard, um, you know, Windows uh, operating system file save. If I'm doing this, if you remember correctly, I, or if you remember, I, I, can, I can do this also from a tablet. If I generate report from a tablet, it actually creates an email with the text file. And so I can email that file directly to that project manager. Again, these are just tools. You don't have to use them. But, uh, but basically, I've gone and, and done every single step that I needed to for that setup. Now, each of these is just links. These are just links to places either in my inputs, my outputs, or places in the menu. And so here you can see some of the other things that are in the menu. We've already seen configurations. That's how I did the Orange Theory Fitness. And I've got these other configuration files available to me. Other things that I have in my menu, scenes. So I can create different scenes that I want to save and recall. And, uh, and so, you know, if I've got, uh, if I'm happy with the scene, I can uh, hit, uh, hit save. I can choose to either save all channels or just save specific channels. And so, uh, um, you know, maybe it's just these two microphones and uh, those two inputs and then these zones, whatever. Um, and also I can choose to save it either on the internal drive or on my USB stick. And once I hit save, it goes to, uh, um, oh, actually, I don't want to save it as that. I want to save as, this is spin class. Okay, and now I'm going to hit save. Yes. And so again, it takes a second and now it's, uh, it's saved that scene. Um, and maybe I'm going to do another uh, save and I'm going, in this case, I'm gonna emergency. So maybe it's for an emergency page or, uh, you know, fire alarm or whatever. I hit save. Yes. And so now it's, it's saved that. And I'll get to that in just a minute. So these are just, again, it's just tools. I can schedule scenes. So, you know, maybe I'm going to uh, create a new event 
and this new event is um, uh, spin class just to keep it easy. Great. And what scene am I going to recall? Well, I'm going to re recall spin class. And when is that going to start? That is going to start at, uh, you know, these guys, it's six in the morning, nice and early. And uh, how often, you know, when, when am I going to end that? Yeah, January of 2070. Sure. How often is this going to repeat? That is going to be daily. Um, or that's just on weekdays. Great. And so every weekday at 6 a.m. is going to recall that spin class, um, uh, you know, uh, event. And I can, I can add events here to it as well. So, you know, I can add more. I can also, oh, you know what? I'm not happy with that one. I'm going to disable that. Or maybe it's seasonal, right? We only do this at certain times. I can, I can disable these events. Again, just working through the tools. We've already seen our wall controllers. We've already seen the smartphone setup. General purpose input setup. So this is how, I, if you remember, I've got two general purpose inputs. And so perhaps I can do, use this for my emergency. So, um, you know, this is gonna be, maybe it's spin class. Um, let's see, I am going to recall spin class when GPI one goes open and when GPI one goes closed, that's my emergency and I'm going to recall emergency. So now if the fire alarm triggers, it's going to recall that emergency scene. So it's just a way to, and, and, and then otherwise it's, you know, it's in the spin class mode, whatever. Ways to, to utilize my general purpose inputs. I'm actually going to reset those because they, well, we'll get back to that. Um, and then there's the, re the report. So you've seen all of these tools now. I do have a system test function. Here I can send sine wave. These are my outputs here. So I can send a sine wave. I'm not gonna do that now, but I can send a sine wave to the various zones. I could send pink noise to the zones or I could choose an input. And, uh, and maybe I'll do that, right? So there's my input signal there and I'm gonna pull this down. And now, so I've got to sending that CD player and I can send it to all the zones. Now I've also got a, re and I'm gonna disable that. I've also got a real-time analyzer so I can look at the various sources. Um, I know that I've got a uh, signal coming in from my CD player. So I've got the Michael Jackson thing going. Um, and if I'm sending signal to that particular output and maybe, you know, if I'll turn the volume up here. Oh, it's on silence, no wonder, CD player. So, you know, and I, as I select the various zones, in fact, let me select the sub. I do have a sub in my system. So you can see the, the sub down there in the, in the RTA. Again, these are just, these are just tools and yeah, turn that off. My network setups. So right now I am connected uh, via, I'm just directly connected from my laptop straight into the MPM. Um, if I use a, a tablet generally, well, I would have to connect via Wi-Fi, but that's fine. I, I, that's actually my favorite way of uh, working. It's harder to show it when I'm doing a webinar. So that's why I, I drive this from, the, from my PC. But uh, obviously I could go through a switch as well. Um, and, uh, but in this case, it's link local 169.254. Security, there are three passwords for the system. Uh, one for MP install, this piece of software. One for MP manage, that's the smartphone or tablet application that I can give to the end user and one for external control. So if I'm going to control the system via Crestron, via RTI or something like that, I have that and here's the password for that uh, third party control. And then finally, here's my hardware settings. And so here's the, uh, here's the time zone and, uh, and you know, save the system log, um, reset the MPM, all of this kind of stuff. Um, we did just release version 1.2 not too long ago, and uh, there was a couple new features in that. Probably the biggest and, and most exciting was the fact that I can now publish a customer's logo to the MP Manage application so they can see their logo on the phone. So that's, uh, um, uh, that's kind of the majority of the, of the features right there. One thing I should mention, 
a lot of our customers uh, sell uh, content and they do not want this USB playback to be visible. They don't want the customer to know that they can play audio. Um, from the factory, this USB playback is, uh, is in the off position. And so from that position, that uh, USB player is not available. So they can't see it, nobody is aware of that. Um, but it does make it useful and handy for me. Um, and so that's why I've enabled the USB player. So you can see these are the tools and now you have seen every single screen that is available in the uh, MPM. Oh, maybe not every single screen. Screen. I can adjust my cue level. Um, if I want to assign a source to that cue bus, um, you can actually see it. Here's an input and there's my cue right there. So that, that, uh, that particular input, that Bluetooth input is now sending to the, the headphone jack. Um, if I just go to my inputs, I've got my cue and I can select which elements are going to the headphone jack or I can also mute those. Um, same thing on the output side, right? Cue, mute. Okay, we have gone through a lot of pieces. And at this point, I want to, uh, uh, you know, address address some questions. And I see only one thing in Q&A. Let's see. Um, do you prefer DHCP versus static IP for networking or is either acceptable? Either is acceptable. Um, I, like I said, I regularly use a, a DHCP server, um, especially if I'm using Wi-Fi. Um, or, or, you know, I've done it also when I'm connected to my PC. Um, uh, but I do find that if I'm connecting my PC, the quickest way is just going link local. And, uh, you know, if I just let that network uh, time out, it will, it will uh, bounce back to 169.254. Is the second question, is there any ability to load pre-recorded messages for paging and triggering them via the app? The answer to that is not yet, but that functionality is coming. Um, We've had many people ask that. And so the way that that would be um, performed is you'd actually be able to save the, um, the audio, the pre-programmed audio that you wanna, uh, you know, you wanna play onto the USB stick. And then there would be a way to trigger that um, USB stick playback. Um, so that function is coming. It's not yet available, but that is something we absolutely are, are uh, interested in doing. Some more questions now. Um, have you seen an application using the MP as part of the sound of a sound masking system? Yes. Um, well, I've never, I haven't seen the actual system installed, but I talked somebody through that. And basically what he did is uh, um, there's a couple different ways uh, to, to do that. Um, uh, the simplest way is using a third party, uh, you know, pink or white noise source. However, we do, if you remember, we do have the pink noise that can be um, selected. I'm going to um, close these. I can select that from my system test and I can now send pink noise. Let me switch over my source. I can send pink noise to those zones and I can, uh, I can EQ that using my output EQs. And so I could, uh, I could absolutely um, self-generate the noise inside the MPM and then uh, EQ it as needed for uh, noise masking. And in that case, you wouldn't have volume up, volume down. You just set the volume in it and it's, and it is, uh, uh, you know, it's set the way it is. Um, how does the scale control affect the loudness function? Really, really good question. Okay, so when I am, um, the scale control, I think you mean uh, the minimum and maximum. So in this case, I've just given it a limited range for the volume to, to be adjusted in. The loudness still, is, still goes zero to 100% because it's based off of the, um, the volume, which goes zero to 100%. And so um, what, uh, the way that the way that this would work then is obviously when it's above it's not affecting it but when it's below i can i can hear that loudness being uh you know being effective on the system if i find the loudness too great i can actually scale that down and turn that down 
Um, but, uh, but quite often I find it a very pleasing effect and I've never had anybody uh, give any sort of negative comments. So generally we, you know, I'm, and I'm just hit reset. Um, I, I usually leave that at, uh, uh, you know, 50, 50 dB, which assumes that it's got a, a fairly large gain range to work with. But that, that was a really good question. Uh, that's actually the first time anybody's ever asked me that. Um, okay. What is the source input impedance? Can you connect a 600 ohm? Uh, yes, directly to an input. Oh, wait, source input impedance. Oh, I was thinking the, um, uh, the um, music on hold. Uh, you know, off the top of my head, I don't remember the source input impedance. I want to say that it is, uh, um, uh, I want to say that it's probably 150 ohms. I don't think it's 600 ohms. I will have to check on that. I, I don't know the answer, that to, the answer to that to, uh, directly. When dealing with the pairing of QSC speakers in the MPM, what's the best way of setting that up if there are multiple speaker types in the same output zone? Well, that really is the, that is the, the, um, the main problem is that if you have multiple speaker types on one output, then there really is no way of having, um, you know, the right, um, you know, selecting the right speaker, unless they are variants as a, an example of that would be, if I'm, if I go into my speaker output and, and I select the factory, factory preset, there are some cases like in our ADS series where we have our new, um, uh, here's our new pendant subwoofer and that subwoofer can be combined with ceiling satellites, pendant satellites or surface mount satellites. So in this case, I am combining pendant sub with the surface mount satellites. But in most cases, I don't have a combined um, uh, speaker preset. That's something that just really, you know, in general, your best bet is put all the same types of speakers on, on you know, the one output and on, you know, so in the, in the restaurant, I'm using all ceiling speakers. And then in the bar, I'm using all surface mount speakers and then I can select the right speaker. Really good questions, guys. Okay. Um, when managers are using the app on a smart device, confirming they can use the app only when on the same way. That's correct. Yes, only when they are on the same, when they are connected to that Wi-Fi network. Um, they cannot use it, uh, um, a, you know, via some sort of off-site tunneling. And then finally, has there been any thought about pairing microphones to be placed in an output zone so as to be able to allow the system to keep volume at a reasonable level? Um, I think the question is in reference to ambient noise compensation. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but I think, um, so, so we do have customers asking us about ambient noise compensation. And that is something that we are working on. That is something that we will be um, adding to the business music system. Again, um, it is a very unique function, but it is something that a lot of people ask about. What we'll probably do is, is on the output, we'll probably replace the feedback suppression in that zone with the, um, the auto, you know, ambient noise compensation because Anti-feedback is really only something you need for a live application. And in that case, you really don't want automatic, uh, you know, adjustment of your, of your output. Um, whereas in true background music, that is a real good application for um, ambient noise compensation. And so that's probably how we'll go about that. Um, it's something that we've, you know, we've put some thought into and we're already working on, but it's obviously not available yet. Good questions. Let's see if there's anything else. What is it? So that's the, that's the last one, the source input. Um, I, and again, I don't know that off the top of my head. I'll have to get back to you on that one, Sean. Well, I, you know, I, I don't hear, I don't see any other questions pop up. Um, I really appreciate everybody's attention. And again, really, really good questions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I can hang on for a few more minutes here and then I probably need to pop off for another meeting. But uh, um, again, thank you so much for your time and uh, um, really uh, 
really appreciate your uh, digging into this and, and taking a look at it.